Hello everyone and a special welcome to our Christian friends in India and our brother Vinay. I want to share for a few minutes this morning uh, from John chapter 8. And the verse that interests me, which I'm going to build up to, is verse 36 which reads, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, as in all the Gospel narratives, it is really important to spend a little time reading the context of any verse in order to understand the setting, to understand what the truths are, around a particular verse is because that setting, that truths, builds the narrative and exposes us to the intent of any particular verse. It exposes us to the key truth which is being um, built up to and put forward by any particular verse. So in John chapter 16, we read there in verse 20 that Jesus was in the temple and he was teaching, he was preaching. What's more significant is that verse tells us that he was in the temple in the treasury. That was the part of the temple where the money bins were. Now, to the Jews, which in chapter 8, when it refers to the Jews, it is specifically targeting the Pharisees and the scribes. To the Pharisees and scribes, the money was everything. The money was as important to them as their own self-righteousness. And so Jesus walks in to the money part of the temple. And all the crowds milling around with all the noise of the talking people and the coins being dropped into the money bins, the money boxes, and that would make a lot of noise. Jesus is standing there preaching. And here in chapter 8, he is declaring once again his deity. He is declaring his sonship. He is declaring that God is his father. Now, the Jews understood the significance of this. They hated Jesus for it. They wanted to kill Jesus because of this revelation. But Jesus was relentless in the exposure of his true identity as the Son of God and God the Father being his Father. And so we are introduced in verse 31 to a rather peculiar group of people amongst these Jews. And it is, verse 31 says, some of the Jews who had believed him. Now this is a peculiar statement because it shows us a rather unpleasant reality that many of us would prefer not to think about. It shows us that you can think you're a believer, but you're not a believer. This tells us of unbelieving belief. This tells us of a deceiving belief. A belief that is false, but it claims to be genuine. So in this crowd, there developed and there came to the forefront a group of Jewish Pharisees and scribes that were beginning to show the signs of what they thought was real belief in Jesus, that maybe Jesus was the Messiah, maybe he was the prophet, possibly he is who he says he was, maybe, possibly. Now, this was a very tense occasion. And if you have John chapter 8 open, look there at verse 19. And Jesus answered them, You know that neither me nor my father. 
Ha! You think you know me, but you don't know me. You claim to know me, but I'm telling you, Jesus says, you do not know me. Just drop down to verse 21. And Jesus said to them, you will die in your sin. Oh dear. These would-be believers who were sort of showing interest, who were giving the sounds and appearance of real belief. Jesus said, no, you need to understand, I see through your facade. I can see through your masks. I can see in your heart. And Jesus said, I'm telling you, you will die in your sin. Now, that's confrontational. Jesus was a brave man. And he's confronting these religious hypocrites head on in a public place, in the place within the temple that they loved the most. The money place where the money was being collected. And just drop down to verse 24. And Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Who is he saying this about? He's saying it about himself. He's saying, I am, as we read back in verse 12, I am the light of the world. They understood that what that meant. Jesus is saying, I'm the revelation of God to the world. I'm the light. I'm the visible exposure of all that the Father is to the world. And you don't truly believe me. And as he said there in verse 24, unless you do believe that I am who I say I am, Unless you are convinced and you acknowledge and you yield your entire belief to the fact that I am the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the light of the world, you will die in your sins. That is extremely confrontational to a Jewish Pharisee or scribe. A little later on in the same discussion in verse 28, Jesus says to these these false leaders, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Now these these people, these false leaders, did their best to treat Jesus as if he was some sort of crackpot, a crazy man. We learn from Mark's account of Mark chapter 3 that um, they had already accused Jesus of doing his miracles by the power of Satan, of Zizubal. And Jesus said, that is the unpardonable sin. And here we are sometime later, they're now sort of rethinking, reconsidering, but deep down inside they they are willing to maybe consider the possibility that he is a prophet or a good man. But they will not accept that he is the Son of God and that God the Father is his Father. And Jesus intensifies that tension within them by saying, listen up, realize that I don't just speak as an individual. When I speak, when I teach... I am not simply giving my view. I am not simply teaching my interpretation. I am not teaching my opinion about the Torah or the Pentateuch, the Old Testament law. No, when I speak, I speak the very words that God the Father has taught me to speak. Now, once again, these educated the Pharisees who knew their Old Testament understood what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming that he is God. And when he speaks, God speaks. And that is correct. Amen. Praise God. We know from the word of God that when Jesus speaks, we are listening to the very words of Yahweh. 
Jesus is not simply a religious leader. He's not simply a representative of God the Father. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He is, by extension, the Father in human flesh. He is divine. He is God in human flesh. And when he speaks, God is speaking. So you can imagine being in the crowd on that day, the atmosphere would have been electric. It would have been tense. These Jews would have had their hearts just enraged with the insult of what Jesus was saying to them. And yet some of them thought, well, maybe we can still believe in this man. Maybe there is a place for this Jesus fellow in our thinking. Maybe we can fit him in somewhere. And so there in verse 31, Jesus begins to dismantle their false belief. He begins to deconstruct their self-deception. Jesus begins to peel back the layers of their wrong theology, their wrong doctrines, their wrong application of biblical truth from the Old Testament. And I love the way Jesus combines application with theology. It's brilliant. And here it is. He says to the Jews that are sort of moving forward in the crowd, as, oh, we believe in you, Jesus. Excuse the cat. And look at what he says there in verse 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Oops. He had them. He, he had nailed the nail of divine revelation right through their corrupt, evil, wrong beliefs. Now, remember, he had just told them a few verses earlier that when I speak, I speak what the Father has told me to speak. He has just told them, I speak the words of God, the Father, Yahweh. And now he says, if you really believe in me, if you if your belief in me is as credible and as genuine as you claim it to be, you will accept the truths from the Father that I speak to you. You will accept that when I speak the word of God, I speak as God. And he says, if you abide in my word, he doesn't say if you abide in me. He didn't say, if you abide in your belief about me. No. Is it if you abide, if you remain under the conviction that when I, Jesus, speak, God is speaking to you. Realize this is face to face. He's in the money chambers with these Pharisees and Jews and scribes. He's eyeballing them face to face. And he's saying, you must Abide, remain in the belief that my word is Yahweh's word. And then he says, if this is true of you, you are truly my disciples. You are truly one of my followers. Verse 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, there's a, a truth buried in verse 32 that we often don't stop to think about. It's because it is significant that verse 32 followed verse 31. If you want to know if you're genuine, if you want to test the authenticity of your belief, if you want to apply some test of genuine faith in your life look to see if you abide 
in the authoritative word of Jesus Christ as God. And if you do, you can know that the truth that I, Jesus, speak as God is the truth that sets you free. Now, here Jesus is claiming to surpass the Old Testament law. These Jews would have understood this. In the temple, he is placing his revelation of truth as divine God speaking the words of the Father as being in authority over the Pentateuch, over the law of Moses, over the many, many laws that the Pharisees and scribes had cooked up and created. Over and above all those laws, Jesus says, my word has heavenly divine authority. I speak from the Father. And you must believe in the authority of my words, of my teaching, of the truth that I present. Only that truth can set you free. Now, at this point, these pretend believers are thinking, uh, but what about the laws? What about our rituals? What about all the things we must do, must do, must do, the way we dress, the way we walk, the rules that we've created around the Sabbath? What about all those things? And Jesus, in effect, is saying, all of those are irrelevant because you are going to die in your sin. Because those rules cannot save you. Those rules, those man-made rules and laws actually entrench you further into the, your slavery of sin because you have misrepresented the truth of God by recreating his, his law into your own laws with your own twists on them. His truth, Jesus said, is the only truth that can set you free from the death penalty of your sin. And that's what John 8 is about. So by the time you get to um, the end of verse 32, things are really humming. <laughs> the, the atmosphere in that money room would be changing very quickly from stressful and electrifying to absolutely disastrous. Jesus had unmasked them. Jesus had touched his finger on the very core issue of their self-deception and religious nonsense. And so, verse 33, they answered him, But we are the offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Well, hang on. To start with, that was not a true statement. Remember who was ruling Israel at this time? It was the Romans. As they spoke their words, they were under the rule of Rome and Jerusalem. Rome controlled Jerusalem. Politically speaking, and militarily speaking, Israel, including these men, these Jews who were saying these ver words, were actually enslaved by the Roman Empire. So they were not even telling the truth as they make this statement. So suddenly, they've made in just three verses a huge transition from saying, oh, we believe in you, Jesus, to saying, oh, hang on, no, no, we believe in our ancestry for Abraham. Our ancestry from Abraham can actually do more for us than you can do for us. That's a big shift to make in three verses. So it turns out their belief in Jesus was not actually belief in Jesus. They were hanging on to their ancestral belief. They thought their identity as Jews and being descendants of the the patriarch Abraham carried some sort of significance that would 
qualify God to sit up and go, i got to give these people my attention. They're descendants of Abraham. And Jesus was saying, well, that means nothing. And so Jesus answered them in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now, they would have understood the offensiveness. They would have felt the offensiveness of that. Jesus had already told them, you're going to die in your sin. If you don't acknowledge who I am and the authoritative divine nature of my teaching as being divine truth, you will die in your sin. And now you've got to understand that because you practice sin, you will die in your sin. Everyone who practices sin, he says, is a slave to sin. You are not liberated from the slavery of sin just because your ancestor was Abraham. You are not liberated from the the slavery of sin because you are a Jew or because you are a Pharisee, because of your religious activities and beliefs. None of that has the capacity to set you free from the slavery and the power of sin over your life. And so we come down, as we flow to verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So, verse 36, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Wow, he had just encapsulated the guilt of their slavery to sin. That all their religious beliefs and ancestry could not set them free from their slavery to sin and the death penalty that rests upon their heads because they are slaves to sin and they will die in their sins. He as God has spoken that truth to them face to face and in public The word was out. They were unmasked. They were exposed. They had been nailed. He had identified their true identity as being self-deceivers, trapped and enslaved by sin within the lies and the falseness of their wrong, man-made Jewish beliefs. And he says... But if you want to be set free from all that, if you want to be delivered from all that, you believe in the Son himself. You believe in me, in effect, is what Jesus was saying, and I will set you free. All the things that trap you, all the wrong beliefs and laws and regulations and self-righteousness, all the things that have deceived you and locked you into the slavery of sin and wrong religious beliefs that are condemning you to an eternity in death and hell, I can set you free from all that and liberate you and give you eternal life. They would have understood this. They got the message. It had got in here, it had got in there, conviction was turned up, the volume of their conscience was at full volume. And they understood the intensity and the personal probing nature of what Jesus was saying to them. How do you know that, Lincoln? Because as you read on, look at verse 37. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you wow a few verses earlier they claimed to believe in him now only half a dozen verses later they want to murder him they want to kill him his revelation of his authority and his divine message of truth and power over sin was so offensive to them that they wanted to kill him. They wanted him gone. You know, the wonderful truth of John fourteen six. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
no one who comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. These Jews, on this occasion, in the money room of the temple, they understood what Jesus was saying. Instead of, instead of repentance, instead of bowing in submission to the lordship of King Jesus, they looked him in the eye and said, you're dead, mate. you got to die. We want you out of our lives. We want you out of our temple. In fact, we want you out of the world and we will get rid of you. We want to kill you. You are going to be gone, Jesus. Well, this was not his time. Jesus here in John 8 did a masterful job in this very brief confrontation with these false leaders of exposing the horrific nature of their sinful beliefs, their self-elevated opinion of themselves had deceived them into being trapped under the mastery of sin. And Jesus confronted that head on. So my friends today, as you listen to this, the same challenge goes to you and I as to these Jews on this occasion. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that when Jesus speaks, God speaks? Do you believe that Jesus is the only one who can set us free from our sin and set us free from the death penalty that we deserve because of our sin. Only Jesus can set us free from that. Our heritage, our national heritage, our church heritage cannot do that. The denomination we belong to cannot do that. The family we belong to cannot do that. We may have Christian parents, but they cannot set us free from our sin. Only the truth of Jesus Christ can do that. Sometimes we look to politics to try and liberate us in our lives. And they are powerless. Our political heritage is powerless. Our political history is powerless to set us free from the death penalty of sin that rests upon us only belief in Jesus Christ only trusting that Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for me and if I was the only sinner in the world at the time he would still have gone to the cross of Calvary to carry my sin in his body so that the father could be appeased so that the propitiatory work of Jesus Christ could have been accomplished in the heart of the Father, and the heart of the wrath of God could be fully vented on Christ for my sin and for your sin. That is the only belief that will set you free. That is the only freedom that should interest your minds. That is the only freedom that should captivate your beliefs. And that is the only freedom that should captivate your beliefs, your doctrines and your theology. All other freedoms flow from this freedom. All other freedoms are secondary. All other freedoms are submissive to this freedom that exists through faith in Jesus Christ, who alone can set us free from the slavery of sin and from the death penalty that sin has over our lives. And so I encourage you today to test your hearts. Imagine that you are in this crowd spoken about in John chapter 8. And imagine that you are close to Jesus, only maybe two or three meters away from Jesus when he's speaking these words. And he is looking at you in the eye. And he points the finger and he says, only belief in him, in the Son, can set you free from the power of sin, of the slavery of sin. 
oh, I pray that's true in your life today. If it's not, if you've never confessed this, do it now. Heaven's waiting for you. The Lord of all glory has inclining your ear, waiting for you to confess your sin, to confess your belief in Jesus Christ, to confess that you put no trust in religion or politics or your your ancestry. No trust in that at all. God is waiting to hear you confess that you only trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Do that now. Reach out to him by faith. Call out to him in your heart. Confess him as Lord, as God. Confess Jesus as the only truth this world shall ever know. And confess that Jesus is your saviour, the forgiver of your sin, and that Jesus is your Lord and Master. Oh, may that be true in your life today. For his glory we pray. Amen.